Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Art Gallery of Hamilton. It's nice to have all of you here tonight. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to a talk before, I am very happy to welcome you. A little bit of housekeeping. I've been talking a lot today, excuse me. <laughs> a little bit of housekeeping to start the day. Um, the exhibition spaces on the first floor will be open until 9 o'clock tonight. So once we are finished hearing from Yuri, I invite you to go into the space and explore the exhibition. If you haven't seen it yet, it is a must that you that you spend some time there. Uh, the washrooms are located outside of these first doors and to the left. And um, we have two other events upcoming related to our fall season of exhibitions. On November the 24th, Ihor Holubitsky, who is one of the curators of the Beyond the Crease Danby exhibition, will be here to speak about that exhibition. And on Thursday, December the 1st, we will also host a panel discussion related to the Danby show. So I hope that we'll see some of you there for those events. My name is Laurie Kilgore Walsh, and I'm the Senior Manager of Education here at the Gallery. And it is my, my great pleasure to tell you about our guest tonight. Yuri Deutsch left Slovakia in 1968 when Russia invaded and has since settled in Toronto. He is an internationally celebrated photographer whose works is included in collections of the National Gallery of Canada, the Slovak National Museum, the Library of Congress in Washington, among others. In 2001, he received the Medal of Honor from the Slovak Ambassador to, to the United States. His work includes nine books, among them Honor, which pays tribute to Canadian World War II veterans, and Last Folio, which is what we're here to hear about tonight. Uh, recently, uh, another book, North is Freedom, is currently showing, uh, another project, North is Freedom, is currently showing at the Canadian Embassy in Washington. Last Folio has been shown in 15 countries across Europe, North, and South America. I believe that this exhibition is the, is the first for Last Folio here in Canada. So please join me in welcoming Yuri Deutsch. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I didn't expect that I'm going to have a speech today. I understood that it was by, I expect some intimate small group of 10 people having a talk, drinking wine and uh, eating. <laughs> so I'm really unprepared. Nevertheless, and I don't have my cohorts, Katya, it's usually she does the speech and I just say one sentence, go and see the pictures, because pictures worth a thousand words. So today is my first solo talk. So if there's some rough edges, excuse me, because as I said, I really didn't expect that. Yes, this exhibition was, uh, and it's still traveling all over the world. Every item on me was bought in another country. My shoes are from Berlin. <laughs> My jeans are from uh, Sao Paulo because they lost my luggage. <laughs> so they give me $100 to buy. My scarf is from Russia because it was so cold, <laughs> I was dying. <laughs> and I don't know what else is on me, which is <laughs> from another place. Um, you, want to hold, you want to hear the whole story or part story? <laughs> okay. Uh, some topics come to you, or like I was commercial photographer, so somebody like my friend here would give me a job, and um, they give me a layout, or they tell me roughly what to do, and I do it. In 19, 1997, I was still working happily as a commercial photographer, uh, when I got the sad news from Slovakia that my father died. So I flew back for funeral. And um, I knew that my father was writing a book about the history of Jews in Slovakia. And he was asking me to help him, but I told him that I'm really not interested. It's uh, your topic, something you are interested in. But I left this continent to to start new life, new chapter, and I'm really not interested in past. As I was 
leaving the funeral, there was an elderly lady going down the stairs as well. And I asked her if I can help her just to go down the stairs. She said, no, she's fine. So uh, I said, she said, I have a job. I'm in a rush. I said, where are you rushing? She says, every day I go and visit Holocaust survivor and bring them some cookies and keep them company. I said, fine. And then she says to me from nowhere, she says, when I was in Auschwitz in 1942, I think, she said the transport of Greek Jews came and there was one woman intensively looking at me. I came to her and I, I asked her, why are you staring at me? And another woman told her, told this lady, this old lady, you know, she is a king, she's a Greek king fortune teller. So this old lady says, if you are a fortune teller, tell me my fortune. In Auschwitz in 1942, the woman looked at her and she says, you're going to live. Only one member of your family will survive. You will get married later in your life and towards you will have no children and towards the end of your life an angel would come and take care of you i said what happened she says only my brother came from the war i got married when i was 40 and uh, i have no children the angel was not mentioned but five years later i actually met an angel i was so touched by this story that that really changed my whole life. This all happened in span of maybe three minutes. But I begged her to take me with her to visit those people, and she did. And that was beginning, it happened 1997. And I changed my photography, I changed my approach to life and I realized there's more to life than just taking picture to sell product. I still like to sell product <laughs> because you have to make a living, but this sort of took me to another level of thinking. Uh, with this lady, we spent five years uh, traveling. Like I was coming because my mother was still alive, and every time I came, I visit her. And five years later, the young lady opened, my, opened the door, and old lady says, I'm too old now. By the way, her picture is the, it's the lady with white uh, blouse, and she have a, one of those buggy to hold. Um, the young lady opened the door, and the old lady says, Yuri, I'm too old now. You know, I'm getting weak. This young woman will take you around. So we went to first place, and the first gentleman says to her, Wanda, you are my angel. And that light come to my head. I said, oh my God. There was a prophecy. And it, so I, I told the story to Wanda, but she said, that's not, you know, I'm not the an angel. And then I went to old lady. And I said to her, do you remember the prophecy you told me? Actually, that happened a year later because a year later we start filming her and I remind her about this prophecy and she says she didn't remember anymore. She was, her memory was gone. So I was the only person in the world who actually met the angel and see fulfillment of the prophecy, which sort of is a strange feeling because old lady didn't remember and young woman didn't believe me. Uh, the project actually turned sort of mystical or there was too many serendipities happened. And I was never, I was not brought up religiously at all because in communist country, religion was taboo and I didn't really care too much about that. But you start thinking a lot, so many serendipities happen on things which you, like, you didn't expect it will happen later in your life. In 2005, now another serendipity, 
in 2001, I was asked by Slovak embassy in Washington to do an exhibition of survivors. So exhibition is supposed to be September 12, 2001. On September 11, 2001, I go to the plane, 7 o'clock in Toronto, flying to Washington. We were in there, we, came, we arrived to Washington and the Slovak embassy uh, uh, cultural attaché was waiting for me, but he, wasn't lis he was not listening to radio. And he says, this is so strange. I've never seen an airport so empty. We must be probably the only plane who actually landed. So we come to embassy, and we, he still was listening to tapes, and we were passing uh, Pentagr Pentagon, probably around 9 o'clock, which was most likely 10 minutes before he's, it got hit. We come to embassy and we, we realize what happened. So I ask ambassador, do you still want me to do exhibition? And this is his words. We don't let those bastards to change our lifestyle. Shows goes on. He was brave to do it because not too many, we expected, you know, big crowd. We got enough people, but it was a strange time. And sort of indirectly related what I was doing. Uh, the culture diminished, di destroyed. Uh, we call this project cultural memory because that's what it is about. It's not about specific historical, it's about how culture can be destroyed, but how it can be preserved through art. Now, those things I didn't realize when I was doing, because that's, that wasn't really my object. Uh, my, uh, my idea was just to photograph the survivors and then close this chapter and finish. In 2005, I was on a shoot in St. Lucia and I broke my knee, and I had operation, and I couldn't do anything, so I was just lying in the bed, thinking what to do. When I was thinking what happened to all the people I used to know in Czechoslovakia when I was a teenager. Like, you know, when you're lying in the bed, your, brain, your head goes on, and you're thinking about different things. And then I was thinking, one that, this was beginning of internet, this was uh, chats on, uh, so I said, what about if I just make a chat group and invite people who left in, in 1968, because that was a mass um, immigration, and see what happened. In about three months, I had about 300 people on this chat group from 17 countries. So then I thought it would be fun to meet them. So we decided to do a reunion after 37 years, I think. We had a reunion in Bratislava, which was phenomenal. The truth is I want to meet some of my old girlfriends. So that's <laughs> <laughs> but that, that I didn't tell anybody. I was just curious how they look. <laughs> and if I did right. <laughs> So uh, we are in Bratislava, 2005. We have, I don't know how many people are here, but there was 300 people. And some of the people who organized the whole thing in the, on the premises decided they would like me to show those black and white pictures of survivors. I was very reluctant, but they said, you have to do it. So then 10 o'clock, one of the ladies came and said, okay, everything ready, projector is ready. There was such a good, that's the lady, yeah? that's uh, Ružena Vajnerska. This is when she already didn't remember. Amazing, amazing remark. I was sort of her adopted son. Everybody saw that I was the angel, but I said, no. I just don't have quality. I don't qualify to be an angel. <laughs> um, 
So I didn't want to show the pictures because I thought it would be too depressing. But uh, this is the word of this lady who got the projector. She said, listen, it took me so much effort to get the F projector. <laughs> <laughs> you better show this. Doesn't matter how depressing it is. <laughs> so I said, okay, if you want to be ruin this whole atmosphere, fine. So I'm showing these pictures, and there's a silence, absolute dead silence in the room. Many people recognize those people. And uh, with my luck, there was a movie producer from London in a room. The woman worked on, in CBC, in the BBC, on Panorama program. I don't know if you know that program in England. And she was not interested really in, in the slideshow. She was looking opposite direction, talking to her friend. When she turned for her drink, and she saw a picture, and she recognized somebody. So she sort of was stunned. And then she came to me, and she says, uh, listen, I just saw this presentation. Um, I would love to do a small documentary film about this. I said, about what? About you photographing survivors. Now, I heard this story so many times, and so many people came, let's do a movie, let's do a movie, and of course, it never happens. So I said, you know, I have to sure. <laughs> so I said, sure. And I still figured that that's to, that will be the end of this, another film. Uh, again, another unusual serendipity. There was a professor at university in Tennessee, and he died, and he left $15,000 endowment to this producer on the condition that she used the money for some project about Slovak Jews. So uh, she called me and she says, if you are interested, come back. I have a seed money and we can start the project. So I came back and the first lady we photographed was Ruzhenka uh, Wynerska. And that's what I told you the story about. Uh, boy, I'm going to like, I'm catching all my past and it's, it's been a long time. So we started photographing survivors. We had a film crew. First of all, I made the film crew. I had to enter. She wasn't sure if we will fit because it's sort of like a temporary marriage. There was a film, there was a filmmaker, there was a sound people. So somehow we had to get acquainted. So we go, we had a car and we travel from place to place. We are in Eastern Slovakia in a small town and we're photographing a couple. There's a picture of the couple. She's showing the picture and her husband is standing behind her. And suddenly somebody knocks on the door, a neighbor, and says, I had to talk to you guys. I had to talk to you. Uh, Katya, the producer, she's, uh, she's a very tough lady and people from gallery met her and <laughs> they know how she is. She's like a pit bull. <laughs> and she have a, luckily she's not here, otherwise I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> so Katya said, no way, get out, you know, I don't have time. But the guy said, please. And then he invites her to his apartment. Oh, he says, but I have a, old Slivovitz in my ha apartment. Well, that changed the whole game. Katya, her Slivovitz, she said, okay, we're going to have a drink and then we're leaving. So we have a drink and she noticed that Slivovitz was from 19, like it was long, long, it was old Slivovitz. She said, how did you get this? And the guy said, you know, there was a last Jew living in this town, a part of the couple you photograph, and there's a little room which he gave me key to, and that's where I find the sleeve of it. So Katya said, okay, I would like to see the place. Next morning, I give you five minutes. So next morning, we go to this place, and that was the school room, which you saw before. And you saw it in the exhibition. So we went to the school room, and I saw those books sitting on the shelves, and 
you know, we have now, after all these years, we have different story. My story was that we came in, we look at the book, I did some snapshots, and we left. Gacha saying that we stay for eight hours, so I don't know anymore what is truth, because your memory just go. The truth is, I was totally smitten by the books. Like suddenly, everything what I photographed till now was unimportant, and the books become like focus. So I come back to Canada, and I spread the pictures of books on my table. And I realized something is missing here. So I show it to my wife, and she says, well, just the books. I said, you're right. There's just some, just books. But there's so much more in those books, except I didn't get it. So I called Katya and said, listen, I have to come back right away. She said, why? I have to go to those books. Those books, there's something there which I know have magic, but I cannot get it. I didn't get it first time. She said, fine. Since then, our budget sort of start mushrooming. We start having uh, sponsors, so we could afford this. So I flew back. I went right away to the books. I locked myself in the room, and I threw her out. And I just want to be alone. I just could not. I didn't want to have any influence on my brain, just the books. And unconsciously, I make a decision. All these things that I'm telling you right now is conscious. I'm telling you something which I actually experienced. But now I, I can logically explain. When, when I was with those books alone, I cannot logically tell you how I felt because I was not planning anything. I just want to be alone, look at those books, and photograph each book and each photograph is unconnected to the next one. So there's originality in each picture. Later on, we came, somebody told me there's another bunch of books in another town. It happened to be town where my father was born, but that, it didn't pay too much attention to that. I didn't have any family there, and so what? So we came to this town. There was a room full of books. There must be 5,000 books, and everywhere you look, there are books. So I said, how does books came here? The lady who took us there, she survived. She was half Jewish, and she survived the war by hiding, and she's the only person who knew about this place. She says, there was a beautiful 17th century synagogue in this town. Now, during the communism, the communist regime had no sense of aesthetics. They just didn't have it. You can see that on the buildings. Aesthetic was the last thing. Everything was brutal. Uh, if they thought efficient, but it wasn't efficient. So this synagogue, which was on Main Street, which was probably the nicest building in town, it was sitting in somebody's eyes as a sore. So they decided to tore it down. It's the most beautiful building in town. Why? Apparently, they need a parking lot. In the town of, if there were five cars in that town, that was too many. So they tore this beautiful building, but night before they tore it down, this is the story she tells me, five old men, Jewish and non-Jewish, went and took every book they could find from this building to this small building they got as a substitute. So the books were just lying there. And uh, we opened book by book. And we noticed there's a stamp on each book, which we didn't notice before. In the first place, the books were so dilapidated that we didn't even bother to open. But this was different. This was books which belonged to individuals. So Katya was putting them on the floor one by one. And she said, look at this. This is the whole town here. There are different professions. And then she comes to me and she says, uh, and I was photographing that picture which you see, those little leather, uh, there's a picture like snakes. And I was concentrating on that. And she said, you know, Yuri, you never told me the name of your 
of your family. I said, why you want to know? I just, I'm curious. What was your grandfather doing? What was his name, first of all? And I never met my grandfather, but I knew his name was Jacob. And even that, I wasn't sort of, we never talk about grandparents. I never had any grandparents. And I, it wasn't something I was talking about. So I said, I think his name was Jacob. And she says, what was his profession? I said, why are you asking me this? I said, I'm curious. I said, he was a tailor. What kind of tailor? He was doing a dresses for women. And where did he live? And it just that down, that I'm in the town when he was living, but I really wasn't thinking about it. I said, you know, this is actually a place where he come from, Michalovce. And I was getting really cross with her, and she says, don't get so hasty, look what I found. She opened the book, there's a stamp, Jacob Deutsch, Taylor, Michalovce. Beyond any doubt, that book belonged to my grandfather. Something I really didn't look for, but that's what I found there. The book was given to him by another family, which, which I knew. There were two uncles who survived war. They lost their kids, they lost their wives, but they, they survived by miracle. So, another one of those serendipitous things which happened on this journey. There's lots of other little details which I'm not going to bother you with or bore you with. Sto people were telling me story, but I didn't want to listen to all the story because it was too hard. If I listened to two stories a day, I was wiped and I couldn't take it anymore because it was, you cannot imagine, like your brain cannot compute the horror what was ho happening during the World War II in small town where from one day to another, the whole town, like half of the town, is herded to a, to a building or synagogues, and then all of them were taken same day by a train to concentration camp. And when you come to concentration camp, three quarters immediately gas, and those who survive, it's just pure miracle. One lady told me I survived because I had a nice writing and they needed somebody to write. So I said, I cannot take it. So I hired somebody to travel with me and I said, you get the story. And because I just want to do pictures. All what I want to is to do those faces. I am not historian. And as I said, if you are, doesn't matter what kind of human being you are, you listen to one or two story and you just, you stop working because you just cannot believe that the human can be such, and I don't use the word animal because you know, that's, animals are not like that. But the some of the story where, one of the story, I, I went to another room and I overheard the story and I just could not believe because this was a Hollywood, uh, Hollywood book, novel or Hollywood scenario. So I'm in another room and this guy, I'm in little town and I ask, is there anybody else I can photograph? And this lady said, there's a, there's a guy down the street, he's Canadian, you know, go and photograph him. So I called this guy, I said, I'm from Canada. Oh yeah, come in, come in. So I come in. So I said, uh, who survived the war? He said, uh, well, we both survived, but very different way, me and my wife. So in a, it will take about 10 minutes to tell you the story. In, before the war, a Slovak guy from a little village goes to France, fall in love with a woman, brings her home, and, she, and he have two kids with her. Come World War II, and two boys are taken to Slovak army. This was, Slovakia was uh, together with Nazis, they were allies. There's a Jewish guy in the office who is like a slave labor and he just find out that the mother of this soldier was Jewish. The soldier didn't, I don't know if he knew that. So he said to the soldier, I said, listen, you better escape from here because if they find out you are dead. So 
they escaped to Hungary and over there they joined British, they went to British Embassy and they joined underground. The Brits take them to Egypt, they train them as a spies, bring them back to Europe. After the war, he sits at the railway station and he's an officer of British Army. A train comes and there's a noise. So he comes to investigate and he sees a woman in, a, in a, one of the cars. He falls in love with her immediately, on the spot. He said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to my village. Where are you coming from? I was in Auschwitz. I'm going home. I survived. He goes with her. He marries her. Have two kids with her. And then in 1948, Czechoslovakia stopped being a democratic country, become communist. He goes to Austria and leave her with two kids in Slovakia. And he joined French Foreign Legion because he cannot go back. She stayed with those two kids, but she doesn't tell the kids her story. She had a tattoo. She told them she was a partisan and she was caught by Nazi, and that's why she was in camp, and that's why tattoo. She doesn't tell them anything about the background. He is joining Fr uh, French Poland region. Then he goes to South, to South America. He joins CIA. He's a, I mean, the guy lives incredible life and eventually end up in Canada. 50 years later, 1989, one of the daughters decides she's going to look for the father. So she comes to Canada, but she doesn't have any connection. She cannot find him. And when she finally gets a phone call, he says, I'm with another woman. I'm sorry, blah, blah. Year later, communism collapsed. His wife dies. He calls his daughters and says, sorry, I was so horrible to you. Come with your sister. I want to show you a good time. So they come to Canada. He takes them all over the country. He takes them to US. And uh, then he said, what now? And she said, well, would you like to talk to your wife from 50 years ago? He said, well, I don't think so she would like that. I said, well, let's try. So they call her. And uh, this is specifically, I ask, like, what did he ask you? Well, he says, would you like to see me? And her first word was, but I'm fat. <laughs> so he says, I'm fat too. <laughs> and he came back, and they live last seven years together. Now, the story doesn't stop here. Meantime, one of the, one of the daughter have a son. And there was an exchange program with the United States. Son goes to the United States, and mother says, be nice and help people when you are in somebody's old home. He happened, by coincidence, go to a Jewish house, who was, which was religious. And they had two sets of dishes. So the kid says, this is interesting. My grandmother had two sets of dishes. So the people said, your grandmother is Jewish? Said, no, no, of course she's not. But then it sort of dawned on him. There's something strange here. So he comes home and said, Grandma, you didn't tell me everything about you. I said, what do you want to know? I know something, you know, which you are hiding from us. You are Jewish. She said, how do you know? Then she tell, he tells her the story. What can I tell you? <laughs> this is phenomenal. <laughs> this was one of the more sort of cheerful stories. <laughs> The rest of them were just too depressing. This, by the way, was done during the traveling through the country. And we were in a certain mood, and I saw that uh, burning hay, so I just told the guy to stop. We went to shoot this, and then a filmmaker came out, and he says, you know what, I would like to shoot it. And then, you know, we just, I was just for one second, was going to do one shot. This is how shooting happened with us. That's why it took us 15 years. <laughs> because every time I saw something, I have to stop. And I was totally undisciplined. And luckily, Katya was disciplined, so we didn't, 
we're still here, we are not broke, which we should be, if it was up to me. Uh, you know, this lady in the film, she's talking about they were hiding in the mountains and they had one apple. And she said, it's amazing, like when you are hungry, you have one apple and you eat it slowly. You just touch it. This is such a, she said it in the film very, very strongly. By the way, this is a picture of my father. And uh, this is the last picture I did of him and he died 14 days after this. Um, so after we finished filming, we figured out, you know, what now? And then we got the invitation to New York, to Museum of Jewish Heritage. Uh, we need money, so we went to New York. We were raising money. We were going to different places. And we figured out that's it. We need lots of money to launch exhibition, and we just gave up. But there's somebody up there who always looks after us. Katya had the pictures in her house in London, just sitting on the floor in her house. When American woman walks in, she was a f aunt of one of her friends, and the friend asked Katya to take her aunt, who was from Indiana, uh, around London. She just said, do me a favor. The woman walks in, she looks at the picture, she says, what is this? And Katja said, those are pictures Yuri did in Slovakia. This is, what, this is the school. This is where we saw the books first time. She says, uh, what are you going to do with this? She said, nothing. You know, we just ran out of money. And how much money do you need? So Katja told her astronomical sum. The woman had a baseball hat. You know, she looks like Yahoo. <laughs> she says, that's all what you need? Katja looked at her, yeah. She said, no problem. If you need that and you have exhibition in New York, I give you the money under one condition. You have to show it in Indiana as well. So the way in Indiana, uh, at University of Indiana, uh, Bloomington, Indiana. So we had the exhibition in New York, and after that, directly we went to Bloomington, Indiana, where we had the show at this lady who donated uh, gallery to a school. It was a phenomenal experience, and then we got invited to a uh, university in Cambridge. Not here, Cambridge, but in England. It was a beautiful, beautiful building, uh, old building, and it's a gorgeous exhibition. And then we befriended people from Pentagram, who are the, one of the best designers. They help us to put a, build a structure. And if I tell somebody in Toronto that I work with Pentagram, nobody believes me. <laughs> they said, the Pentagram would not talk to you. You cannot afford Pentagram. Who you think you are? <laughs> and this is something you know, which you learn on this trip. You know, there's a bigger world than just little Toronto. Much bigger world. Hamilton. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Much more progressive city. And it's our first city which invited us after we've been in 15 countries around the world. At least, I don't even count anymore. So from Cambridge, we got invited to European Parliament in Brussels. Uh, we were in the United Nations with this show. I must say that Slovak government was very instrumental on helping us. Uh, they look after all the logistic of taking things from place to place. Uh, right now, exhibition is in Jerusalem, taken by Slovak government, and it was opened by Minister of, of Culture. Yes, Canadian government comes to every exhibition, every um, uh, Canadian ambassador in different city comes. Occasionally, they donate wine, occasionally not. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't care anymore because, you know, it's, the exhibition has its own life. The book was published last year by Prestel, which is a title from a company called Bertelsmann, who invited us this year to Sao Paulo, uh, where we have phenomenal exhibition in a building like this, but the whole building is uh, last folio. There's about 80 pieces. Um, we have some pictures outside, some pictures inside. Exhibition actually, I think, ending right now. 
and we have sort of maybe, hopefully we go back to Brazil because that was the place we actually get the most uh, accolades. We were recently on television in Brazil. Uh, they were talking about, they were comparing Aleppo and how, again, the culture is destroyed and how we are showing how culture was destroyed 70 years ago in uh, Europe. So you see the connections and how important it is to preserve culture because that's all what we have. It's memory and culture and, uh, you know, you can put everything away, but that's what is important. And in a small way, I try to preserve memory. And of course, as I told you, it changed me. I'm learning more about who I am and where I come from and who are my ancestors. And uh, that's what it is. Thank you.